Welcome to The Mushroom's Apprentice. I'm your host, Shona Home. My guest today is just 25 years old, and he gives me hope for the future. Garrett Kopp is the Chaga visionary and founder of Birch Boys, Inc., a company well known for its assortment of teas, tinctures, and extracts from healing wild fungi accessed from over 220,000 acres of leased private land in the Adirondack Park. Kopp grew up in the Adirondack Mountains, where he naturally developed a broad passion for the wild northern forests of New York. He began to specialize and narrow this passion toward chaga after helping himself to a cup of what appeared to be iced tea in his grandmother's refrigerator. She was harvesting chaga and brewing it on her own amidst her battle with stage four pancreatic cancer. Soon thereafter, Kopp and his grandmother expanded their chaga harvesting activities to local farmers markets where they discovered significant demand for the fungus and its powerful ability to enhance health. These entrepreneurial efforts landed COP acceptance into Clarkson University's early entrance program, the Clarkson School, where he studied engineering and management and innovation and entrepreneurship. Several years and hundreds of research hours later, COP returned to his hometown. Having shipped, having shipped to over 20,000 individuals throughout all 50 states, Birch Boys has organically grown into a nationally recognized online brand. Kopp is proud to have built a vertically integrated supply chain, sustainably sourcing the fruits of wild tree-borne fungi, carefully harvested by hand before being dried, processed, and extracted with love at his fungi factory in Tupper Lake, New York. He is a self-described naturopath with a mission to establish a permanent abundance of wild chaga while simultaneously advocating for the protection of our birthright to harvest and urging against the embrace of fake lab-grown alternatives. Welcome, Garrett. Thank you. Uh, you're very good at giving that introduction. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> well, this it was a pleasure to, to share that with, with the listeners. And I really, I'm so impressed with what you have accomplished. And I wanna just take it back to the beginning to that uh, that potion in your grandmother's fridge, and really, you know, she initiated you, and mm -hmm. and you don't hear this as much anymore. And so, I'd love for you to just talk about how you came to all of this. Yeah. So, I mean, I had literally just mowed her lawn, so I was like genuinely thirsty. I was parched, and I went into her kitchen, and she always had these goodies in her fridge. You know, she had lemonades, iced tea. She'd have brownies or baked goods. So I just opened her fridge and I found this jug and it was just a pitcher, a blank, you know, clear pitcher with black tea in it. And uh, I poured a tall glass and I drank the entire thing. And I was pouring a second glass when she kind of walked into the kitchen and she looked at me like, like a ghost for a minute. Like she was totally shocked when she realized I was drinking her chaga because she had just, just learned about chaga. She went on this uh, foraging trip with the Tupper Lake Adult Center, which is like a senior citizen group. And she, of course, was battling cancer. And she learned about it in uh, in Maine on this foraging trip that she did with her, her peers. And um, she then found it growing on a birch tree in her backyard, like as soon as she returned home. And, um, you know, it's not even really worth getting into a whole lot, but it's, it's kind of fascinating because uh, her father, my great grandfather, who died when she was six, died frozen to a birch tree actually he um he had had a coronary thrombosis and leaned onto a birch tree for support and and it was winter and he froze solid and they had to cut the tree down to get him home over rollins pond and that's the campground that my grandma and i went to together to start harvesting chaga and i didn't know any of this at the time i don't even know if she ever thought about it but it was just kind of fascinating walking on you know, because she would literally with her cane be out trying to hit these pieces of chaga off of the tree. So I just started helping her harvest it. And it just became a fun thing we did together. And we had so much, there was such an abundance that we just started giving it to people, taking it to farmers markets. Uh, she used to knit scarves and mittens and spin wool with her friends at the adult center. And they had a commercial kitchen where I could like brew the samples and things like that. So we just, I started going with the old ladies to sell chaga <laughs> and we did really, really well. 
That's awesome. That's awesome. And then you start, so how, you were 15 at that I was, time? I was 15, yep. And then when did you start Birch Boys? So as, as soon as I got my driver's license, so six months or so after I had been 16, I drove to the Malone, uh, our Franklin County uh, office in Malone, and I and I got a DBA. It was one of like the first three things I did with my with my driver's license. Uh, so that was January of 2015. So eight and a half years ago. Wow, wow, wow! And your comp company is doing really well. I mean, I I take your tinctures; they're really rich. Like they're there's a quality to them. I mean, they are, they're, they're potent. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Really, really beautiful. So I was saying to you, I want you to tell this story that, so your grandmother, she passed in 2018. You Correct. said, yeah. Did, so, but the Chaga did help her for a while, would you say? Yeah. So, I mean, with my grandmother, but when she realized she had pancreatic cancer, it was stage four. So of course that means it had metastasized. It, yeah. It's good to, and at, 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 and I've learned since then, you know, I didn't really know that that now, but anyone living with stage four cancer, especially pancreatic cancer, which is a very aggressive one, it's like you never really are cured. You know, you're in a lifelong battle and you're always going to be at risk of cancer developing us somewhere in your body. So she had been on chemotherapy at the same time. Um, so she she found chaga and it was just like to me the way i would describe it is like the day that she looked at me like a ghost everything changed when she realized i was drinking the chaga and her eyes lit up and she had this fire in her eyes and she was so passionate and so like she had the energy of a young kid even though she's an elderly woman battling cancer and she pulled me into the backyard and with like the most passionate energy you could really imagine she taught me about chaga and taught me about its history and she she presented it as the king of herbs and she said oh it can fight cancer it can battle this it can battle that and uh you know i was just learning about this all for the first time and um of course i've done my own research and and i have my own opinions on the validity of those statements now and i could put it in a much more articulate way but for me this was just something that gave her hope and and something that gave her you know it was emblematic of her to be so open-minded and positive. Most people with cancer um, at that age and that demographic, having just learned about Chaga, wouldn't have had the confidence and open-mindedness to then go home and immediately start brewing it. And and that for me was what stood out is this was something that at the end of her life, just she passed on to me like only she could. And um, I do think it helped her. Uh, we spent many nights drinking Chaga tea together having great conversations it definitely brought us closer at a really hard time in her life um and i'm just very grateful for it you know i never would have thought it would have taken over my life yeah that's just beautiful and i do feel like she's like a guiding light for your company moving forward and i think that story even of your great grandfather you know with the birch of all trees like something's going on in your family line and it's really special it's weird. I found that out last year. And um, there's, but in the other thing I'll say on, on the fact that she passed, you know, and, and there's ways to consume chaga and to extract chaga that are maybe more targeted at specific benefits. And that, that was some of the stuff we just didn't even know then, you know, so we were drinking tea, but really a lot of the anti-cancer components of chaga are alcohol soluble constituents that the tea isn't going to, to extract. Right. Yeah, you've got a lot of knowledge that you. But I, I wanted desperately to heal her. You know, it was just it did set me on the path of, of healing and wanting to understand. Yeah, what was? Would you mind sharing the story you were going to share with me at the beginning about your grandmother, about her kind of working with you? Oh, yeah. You mean just recently when? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, for a long time, I, I always would. Um, you know, convince myself that she's here watching or supporting. And, and uh, the first time I ever really felt that way was during a really hard time. I actually dropped out of school. Um, so uh, <laughs> my bio doesn't say it quite like that. But in my junior year, and I was on Dean's list every semester, I was just doing too much. I was so busy with school, I was commuting an hour to go there while building my business in Tupper Lake in my hometown. 
and I had to make a choice and I dropped out despite, you know, the recommendation of every, every person in my life. And I, I moved into my office and I started renting a space and I just totally went uh, independent financially. And uh, there were, there were many times I had hard, hard nights, very difficult days in that time. And I would get in my car and I would smell grain, which was so strange because she used to feed uh, my, her, her daughter, my aunt Kim, her horses. So like she would always have grain in her car. And it's the, the most remarkable thing. You smell it as soon as you get in. And I, one time I literally got out and searched my car for grain because I was like sure that there was someone that put hay in my car. And uh, I didn't ever find any. And I was like, huh, that's odd. But I kind of just thought, I, I just convinced myself of that. You know, I kind of talked myself out of it. But then last year, when I moved into the building I'm in now, um, it was reishi mushroom harvesting season. This is a piece of reishi. Oh, uh, well, it's gorgeous. Yeah, and uh, we had no setup in this building. And uh, this this guy, his name, I shouldn't say his name, actually, uh, but he's a harvester who I work with, and he brought me a ton of reishi, and we had to dry it immediately. And so we started working together to turn this walk-in freezer that was in this building into a drying room with a dehumidifier and, and racks. And, and we're in there, in this walk-in freezer, in the basement, you know, trying to dry reishi mushrooms. And he's just looking out the door of the dry room. And it was very strange. Like he's looking at something I couldn't see. And um, we we talked a lot later that night. Uh, we're texting like lightning speed. And I have no idea why, but I just know there's something I should be talking to this guy about. And um, and he ends up opening up to me and tells me that he can see dead people. And I was like, whoa. And so then I immediately asked him and uh, he he basically described my grandmother and he said he saw her just looking in at us, like kind of blocking the door, grinning with no teeth, and she had dentures, and uh, and he was just weirded out because he hadn't had that experience in like over a year. And I have no idea what what that experience is like. I can't do that. I don't have, and I didn't know if I believed him honestly in the beginning, but um, it struck me as like, wow, you know, that is totally what if she was here, that's what she would be doing. She would just be watching it in fascination. Um, and, uh, and then she had knitted me this blanket when I was a, a kid and like every color had a different stripe that was emblematic of one of my personality or something I was passionate about or my, my university colors, right. That was in there. And I lost this blanket several years ago. And that very next day, cause that night I had been talking to this harvester and I was just thinking about her and I was so frustrated that I couldn't find this blanket she had knitted me. And I'm in my apartment the next day after talking to him about how I want to find this blanket. And I walk by my closet and out of the closet, this hamper that was filled with clothes that I hadn't touched in two years flies out of the closet, like with force and it hits the ground and it makes a smack so loud that me and my partner, we whipped our heads around and like, what the heck just happened? It wasn't like it just fell. Someone whipped this to the ground and immediately I realized, oh my God, the blanket must be at the bottom of this hamper. And I started digging and I immediately was like, it's, it's Mimi. I know it. And I dug to the bottom and sure enough, like I couldn't even see it, but I knew I got to the bottom and I saw that blanket and it was like the most profound thing. It was like, she was right there, you know? And she was like, here it is, dumbass, you know, like it was just <laughs> kind of funny. Um, and I have no doubt after that, that like, she's definitely a guiding force. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's, yeah. that is so touching. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. I mean, I really, I said to you earlier, I think you are a kind of medicine man, you know, and initiated by your grandmother, something really wondrous going on in your bloodline clearly. And, you know, it reminds me, a teeny bit of Victor Schauberger, who uh, grew up in Austria, and he's known as the water wizard. You can look him up. He's an extraordinary man. But he was from a family of foresters, and they stewarded that forest, uh, an old growth forest for over 400 years. And their family motto was faithful to the silent forest. And so I just get that similar sense with you. And, and you just stepped right into your dharma. Yeah. You know, 
yeah i mean uh, that's i mean my my arm i have a tattoo that says forever wild and i begged my parents to get that when i was 17 but old growth forests and forestry and all that those are all the things that um all of my family members are deeply passionate about well wow. i'll i'll quickly say that my first few mushroom journeys i didn't come to the mushroom until i was 48 but I took them in the uh, beautiful old growth forest uh, up in the Quinault Rainforest in, in Washington state. So with moss and a waterfall and outside in, in at night, really, really magical. So yeah, the forest is very dear to me. The, the texture of moss specifically on, on mushrooms is like one of the most, it's funny because the first time I ever did mushrooms, I was in, I went into the forest because I was around people and I felt very weird and uncomfortable. And I was like, I need to go somewhere I can be alone. And I went into the forest and I just started feeling everything, like the rocks and the moss. And I came out and my hands were actually bleeding because of how fascinating everything felt. But, um, and that's, you know, not the mushrooms I work with, but a psychedelic experience with yeah. uh, psilocybin mushrooms. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would think that would have to be for you, you know, to just sort of take you even deeper into those realms. So you, you wild craft all the mushrooms like lion's mane as well. Artist cock, obviously. That's a great question. And I wanted to interject. So lion's mane and my are or two mushrooms that we do purchase from a cultivator, uh, forest mushrooms, they're called, and they're out of, um, Michigan. Um, but all of the others, the chaga, the rishi, the artist conch, um, and actually including lion's mane and maitake, we just don't have enough of the lion's mane and maitake to, to source it all wild. That's standard. yeah. Whereas with the other fungi, there's actually a unique advantage in nature's abundance. Like there, there's no reason for us currently to cultivate chaga. There would be no reason to cultivate rishi. It would actually be more expensive um, and nature's capable of providing these things. And a lot of people can't really understand or visualize it if they've never like been to an old growth forest. Um, but uh, I just, I, I kind of grew up in the right place at the right time, especially when it comes to chaga. And, and, and also I will say that the importance of wild harvesting for me, it's not necessarily a mushroom thing, that's a chaga thing. So uh, chaga specifically is, is really like, Chaga, chaga is not even a mushroom, which is kind of an important distinction because a mushroom is the spore bearing part of a fungus. It's reproductive. Um, chaga is a sclerotia, which means something entirely different. Uh, and, and a sclerotia is only developed by parasitic fungi as a defensive organ to protect itself from the host and its immune system that it's growing on. So in, in chaga's case, that's a birch tree. Um, and the chaga develops over years of battling with this birch tree, and it, it synthesizes all these protective compounds to protect the fungus. And um, it's that life cycle and that unique mycology of chaga um, and, and the time that, that forms the betulin, the betulinic acid, the inotodiol, the triterpenes in chaga. Like, there are certainly ways of growing chaga indoors. Um, but you're just going to get like a lumpy mass if you grow it on brown rice flour. You're not going to get any of these compounds. And the entire uh, product, the entire outcome is materially different. It doesn't share the same colors. It doesn't share the same basic physical and chemical properties. So with chag, and I mean, you can cultivate things like lion's mane and maitake in a way that's authentic. You know, you intrude the benefits of the mushrooms because uh, it produces the same sort of a thing and even the mycelia of lion's mane uh is like is a has medicinal value but when it comes to chaga you know i was just lucky enough to be born in the right place at the right time as people around me the the few in the woodwork that would come out like my grandmother were becoming aware of chaga um, and that is just because in 1987 a russian novel about chaga was translated to english so i was it, just the timing of it hit right I was in the right place. I kind of had the right background and experience because of my family. And uh, and I just witnessed this abundance of chaga that the world couldn't really seem to perceive. And I and I fear now that, you know, I, you can look at all of it historically and, and describe, you know, 
the cause and effect reasons why there's such an abundance now. Like in that, th there's a forest fire that happened at this uh, at this campground where my grandmother and I used to harvest it. And um, what happened is it killed all the trees and white birch trees are a pioneer species that come up first. And uh, so really you have all these upcoming white birch trees surrounded by five bodies of water. And it created this place that called, became known as the birches and all of them grow, grew up and now they're all a hundred year old trees and chaga is everywhere. But that forest is in the next stage of its, uh, of its life, you know, of the secession of the forest. And that's not always going to remain. So, uh, so you have human activity, uh, which causes this butterfly effect, sometimes good, sometimes bad. And right now with the logging industry, uh, you know, there's a lot of debate about chaga sustainability, but what people don't realize is that there was a, a shift in the logging industry's focus about 40 years ago um, and where birch trees weren't ever one of the species harvested. Um, and that's probably why, again, we're so abundant today in chaga and birch trees. But right now, yellow birch trees are one of the, the main four species being cut and sold for pulp and paper products. Basically, they've taken all the old hardwood trees that were valuable, and now it's going to be 100 years before they grow back. And so they have to find other means of generating revenue. And like yellow birch trees, specifically any over eight inches in diameter with a dead top, which, by the way, includes like every single yellow birch tree that has a piece of chaga on it, is just going to be cut and sold. And if it's not going to be cut and sold, it's going to be targeted and killed um, and not sold just because they view in the in the realm of forestry chaga is literally a, an invasive parasite it's a threat to the timber value of the trees and so that's one thing i bring forth in this industry that like a lot of people just don't seem to recognize but the largest stakeholders that are actually going to have the most significant impact you know are trying to get rid of this fungus <laughs> and they're trying, like they're being pretty successful they own the land and so to, what is it that we even do to implement a sustainable future for Chaga? Be because really it starts with the land ownership. Um, I need the rights to these trees, even on my land lease, that's vast acreage. Uh, I don't have the right to inoculate living trees with Chaga. I can simply take what's already there and I try and plan it based on where they're going to go log because I, I get the Chaga before the trees come down. So, um, the nature is totally capable of providing us everything we need. It just, it needs the stewardship. Yes. Yes. Is there any kind of motivation for them to, to, to sort of save some of these trees for medicine? Yeah, a great question. Um, I think that part of it is just opening their mind to the reality that like, there actually could be a more profitable and lucrative model in some of these more well-rounded medicinal uses of the forest. I absolutely think so. I mean, think about think about the amount of effort, machinery, labor, risk involved in cutting down some of these massive trees and to make pulp and paper products, which I imagine is like a, a low margin sort of industry. And I mean, you have to haul it to a mill, you need massive trucks, you need massive saws. It's just kind of like remarkable because uh, I don't, I think they're starting to open up to those conversations. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think positive change is happening. It's just, I, I'm just trying to make it happen sooner. Of course. Of course. I wonder if you could, <laughs> this is sound crazy to some people, but if there would be an opportunity for some kind of partnership with these guys around that, like you would be such a perfect person to really educate them very pol politely and, you know, and, yeah. and, I mean, this could be a big, great side business for these guys. I agree entirely. And, you know, Shona, it's like, it's hard to describe because I've tried that. Um, I have a few contacts in my phone where I'm sending them pictures of Chaga, trying to get them to realize what it is, because I know they're in the forest walking by it all the time, cutting the trees that have it. And um, it's like some people just, they don't see it. But I don't know how to describe it. Like they can't see it like... I, yeah, I don't know. And so others can. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I I do. I I'm like for as 
much of a mess as the planet is right now and the, and the minds of mankind are just like really not in a good place i am i'm strangely optimistic like i i do have hope that there can be breakthroughs here so do i i i in general yeah 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 but it might take a catastrophe or two i think as well. i think that's just human nature mm -hmm. until the caca hits the fan they kind of just keep yeah forging I, forward i mean the, the thing that people overlook though is that evolution is happening all around us and like chaga at the end of the day isn't just like a vulnerable poor little fungus being over harvested it is like pretty remarkably um invasive in in our area like there's a reason that loggers have tried for for hundreds of years actually to strategically eradicate it um and there's really no way that you can unless you you cut down every single tree and burn all of the spores and the like you at the end of the day there's going to be lingering chaga or or fungal matter or spores or hyphae and really at the end of the day i have no concern for chaga chaga is going to be just fine you know it may take hundreds of years to to ever for humans to forget about it because it becomes so um unavailable that people kind of lose interest and and the forces of this lab grown chaga win over right chaga will be fine in one way or the other but like the biggest losers would be people you know we would we would see temporary gaps of time where there's not enough harvestable chaga to use um in the way that people could for therapeutic or medicinal value and um that would be a that would be a shame that's what i'm trying to prevent yes and there are so many clinical studies now that show efficacy i i have the book the fungal pharmacy and so i pulled from that book i did a recent episode on medicinal mushrooms just kind of a general overview and i always knew they were healthy and i've taken the tinctures for a number of years but i had no idea like when you really dig deep yeah. it's good grief like this secures so to everything <laughs> <laughs> it's the one thing we don't have really clearly figured out is dosage right but you're right i mean the compounds that are in these mushrooms like Wachaga, I, I think of a few, betulin, inotodiol, um, trametinolic acid. These are these are things that like are such massive complex molecules. They can undergo like six chemical reactions at a time. And once they enter our bloodstream, the things that they're able to do in a way that's almost magically like designed uh, to be symbiotic with our human biology, which makes sense because, you know, animals branched off of fungi, uh, it's just remarkable. It's totally remarkable that people aren't that the the the, the, few, the science and the the funding isn't focusing so much on this, you know. Yeah. Well, I don't think you can really patent that stuff at the end of the day. Like that's and that's, that's literally it. That is the reason, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's quite subdued, even though uh they're gaining in popularity now. Well, why don't you talk about, you talked about before, so the um, cancer fighting properties are alcohol soluble, then you've got the water soluble. And so you guys do a dual extract tincture, which I think a lot of people are doing. So can you talk about what what is that and why is that important? Absolutely. Look, I came prepared. <laughs> uh, very good. <laughs> My Zoom is kind of blocking it, but there we go. Yeah. You've got your bottle of chaga. Yeah, this is going to be audio, but but just for okay, the listeners. okay, I see. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I've got that bottle of chaga tincture of yours <laughs> as well. I had some this morning. Yeah, I, so it would be a generalization to say that the cancer anti-cancer components are all alcohol soluble, but I do think it's a worthy generalization to make. The most powerful compounds, which are generally triterpenes, um, in in chaga and in the other mushrooms, uh, reishi. Uh, they're, they're, they're alcohol soluble compounds. They're not water soluble. So, um, an alcohol extract is required to get that benefit. And we don't really know how much, uh, of these compounds are in the products. You know, we know from a variety of studies that like, there's definitely inotodiol in Chaga, yet there's not really many commercially available testing services or labs that, that are even capable or offer the, these services of quantifying the, uh, the the actual micronutrients there. 
So there are some water soluble constituents we can test for that have proven immune supporting benefits. Uh, an example would be beta glucans or polysaccharides. Um, and we have actually some pretty good data on that. And um, our tinctures, I'll tell you on a milligram per milliliter level, what you're getting um, in terms of beta glucans. Uh, but my problem is just like, I'm, I'm trying really hard to find a lab that can quantify some of those more complex compounds. Because really, if we could do that, then you can look at the literature that does exist. You know, because I don't know if there are clinical human trials um, on the mushrooms. There, there's no studies that really have defined dosages um, in, in a clinical study that's done over time. Uh, but there are animal studies where you can take that dosage and, and make educated guessing based on like milligrams per kilogram of body weight. And you can kind of piece together a, a solution that does work, you know, for healing. But it, it would be a generalization, of course, to say that chaga can fight cancer, right? Because it, it comes down to how you harvest and process the chaga and, and how you extract the chaga and uh, how you use the chaga. And um, all of that, I think, is just as important as, uh, you know, taking it. Yeah. 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 So, so you guys start by, do you boil it or not, what simmer it? How, how does the extraction process work? Yep. Uh, with the chaga or any mushroom, it's the same extraction process. So we basically steep uh, the ground mushroom at 170 degrees Fahrenheit um, for, for 72 hours. Um, and then we increase it to like 188 degrees Fahrenheit just to like make sure any Anything in the mushroom that's like a bacteria or whatnot is killed um, for sure. And then we basically take that after three days of brewing and we're, we're picky about the temperature because if you go too high, you can degrade some of the constituents. Um, however, with mushrooms, like we're not talking about vitamin C. We're not talking about some of these things that are easily degradable. They, they are present in the mushrooms, but really we're after like some more complex compounds that aren't gonna degrade as easily. So heat is a good thing. Uh, we brew it for three days, and then we take those same mushrooms that have been brewed, we strain them, we squeeze all the, the water out of them, and we, we, we soak them in alcohol. Now, to, to visualize like how we do this in a, in a literal sense, we always have a batch of the alcohol going in advance. So if I was making a tincture today, um, today's batch of hot water extract will go and soak in alcohol for, for the next batch of chaga that's brewed in hot water. That way, every time that we do a hot water extract, we can immediately take the alcohol extract that's been soaking for about six weeks and combine the two liquid extracts together at a ratio of 3.5 parts water to one part alcohol. And it's very cool because you can see the different colors of like this, the different compounds that you're pulling out of the same chaga or the same uh, fungus. Oh, so nice. you can see visually like, wow, there is water soluble components and alcohol soluble components and they're unique. And when you combine them, it's kind of cool and there's a bit of a chemical reaction. Now you have, I believe I read about a friend who also went to college with you and didn't she study biochemistry and isn't she assisting you guys with Maya maybe the yeah, yeah. so um <clears throat> Maya we were both in the early entrance program at Clarkson and she actually is now working for Johnson and Johnson I believe um mm -hmm. actually haven't spoken in a while um, <laughs> oh. she helped me with uh, an extract that I, I basically didn't have enough chemistry knowledge to uh to yeah. figure out how to do um and and it was very helpful but at the same time um you know her dad worked for uh for a pharmacy he basically engineered pharmaceutical facilities <laughs> and uh there's some bias and so but i'm able to work with people and pick pick apart you know the insights that i think are relevant and what are not and and maya was very helpful yeah excellent excellent why don't you talk about, so you're all about the wild harvesting, which makes perfect sense. We have a huge commercial conglomerate now of medicinal mushroom makers. And so what is the commercial process for growing these mushrooms and why is it inferior? Compared well, to 
That's a great question. It's, it's quite nuanced. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to grow mushrooms. So like, for example, the company we work with for the lion's mane and the maitake, they are growing that in like an outdoor simulated, a wild simulated environment. So it's outdoors. They're plugging real logs, you know, lion's mane. What it does in nature is it decomposes like trees and produces a fruiting body. Um, so that's the same way that they're growing it outdoors, you know, um, on logs. There's log grown mushrooms. There's also um, grain grown mushrooms where you can take um, grain and pressure cook it in a bag. And, and then you take that moist grain after it's been sterilized, inoculate it with spores. It will colonize with mycelium. And then uh, once you cut open the bag, it simulates like the, the mycelium reaching the surface of the earth and the air and the oxygen <clears throat> will trigger, <clears throat> that will trigger the development of a fruiting body. So you have mushrooms that are literally being grown in plastic bags um, from grain. Sometimes that's okay. Uh, but also like people will use sawdust. So it has that wood been treated with any chemicals, you know, before the hand, all of these things come into play and become potential contaminants or or just like threats to the integrity of the real medicinal value um i don't think it's a bad thing <laughs> mushroom cultivation but when it comes to chaga i just have very strong opinions about it because one of the leading forces in this industry is paul stamets and he has a brand host defense which <laughs> is kind of remarkable because it explains just how clearly he he understands the the sclerotia being <laughs> a, a defensive organ to protect the fungus from its host right as a brand called host defense and he sells a chaga supplement and it's clear in color which is like and then you look at the back and you read the supplement facts and you see it's you know other ingredients are myceliated brown rice flour oats and and you're like wow so whatever this is doesn't look like chaga it doesn't smell like chaga it doesn't taste like chaga the it's being marketed as if it has the same benefits as chaga but like, to me, this isn't Chaga, you know? And so uh, that's what I have a problem with. I think people are being taken, adv taken advantage of and people that are like in a pretty vulnerable place in their life, you know, putting money towards products that are just total gimmicks. And I think the bigger issue is that we have products being sourced internationally from China. And what happens is that there's a, there's a circumvention of regulatory authority because the FDA is likely not going to go and inspect some of these Chinese facilities, right? Like, and so what happens is you have American brands with big budgets who decide, oh, you know what, let's get into this mushroom industry. They find their Chinese supplier because it's the most cost-effective who aligned with the communist Chinese party, you know, manipulates American brands and consumers. Some of these companies may be completely unaware of the fact that they are selling products that are totally fake. I mean, we get these powders. I, I see the powder that comes from turkey tail. I see the powder I make that comes from chaga. And none of these products on the market look anything like it. And they taste watery or they might taste like literal cocoa. And it's like there, there's a massive fraud going on. That, and I'm not not blaming any individuals. I'm not blaming any companies. I think that I think that Chinese suppliers are taking advantage of American ignorance about mushrooms. Um, and I think that there's a lot of people with big budgets that are just kind of falling into that trap. And, um, and then of course you always have some unethical players and who are trying to just confuse the narrative. And, uh, but it, that, that, that's what I'm deeply passionate about. And that's why to me, wild is important because I could very much see a reality where people like pretend that it doesn't matter, you know, like people really believe we can just cultivate all these alternatives, but they, like, there's real biological roots and reasons why these fungi synthesize these complex compounds and everything is evolving. So if we reduce fungi to these things that are grown in plastic bags, you know, what's going to happen is they're going to become like a literal GMO. It's not going to be the same thing. Um, that's my perspective on it. Yeah. And, and isn't it so also with the grain, the grain contains alpha glucans. Yeah. Not well, actually beta glucans there's there's a different type of beta glucans that are present in grain and you're right some companies are going as far as to not only are they cultivating mushrooms on grain they're cutting open those bags of myceliated grain and throwing that into the product right to cut it but but it's nuanced you know because lion's mane 
like the mycelia of lion's mane does have uh aranacins which are like actually quite medicinal so like with lion's mane using mycelium is actually like a good thing so the narrative is just every every time one of these facts becomes a, a, like a narrative that someone is championing i find that often it's someone's trying to distract you based on whatever their unique um selling point is and in like this whole mycelium versus fruiting body argument is quite interesting to me because number one chaga is not mycelium or a fruiting body yet people will call me saying are you using real fruiting bodies of chaga or mycelium and it's like well i can tell you the truth if you want to sit down for a minute and have a conversation uh but then people like that are selling lion's mane you know the, the answer is that lion's mane may be more beneficial as a combination of the fruiting body and the mycelia Whereas most mushrooms, I find most value is in the fruiting body alone. Um, <clears throat> there's some exceptions. So, what are the exceptions? Well, the lion's mane, obviously, you could do both. Right. The lion's mane, like there's specifically the aranacins in lion's mane, which are responsible for the regenerative properties and the and the nerve growth factor benefit of lion's mane. That comes from mycelia. Now, like our lion's mane does have mycelia at the bases of the fruiting body we make a basically a fruiting body product um but but basically around the base of where you pick the mushroom you get the mycelia we're not taking the grain and the sawdust and throwing that in um but um but you know there's there's so much work that really needs to be done to better understand the optimal ways of doing any one of these things like i i'm trying when i can where i can to, to take resources and funding and actually put it into to accredited lab analysis, like at the pace that we can afford it because it's very expensive. And, uh, and ultimately until we do a lot more of that, it's anyone's guess, <laughs> like, you know, and we have all these people saying all these things, but I, we try and just only speak based on what we actually know. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys also have a Chaga skin cream. Yes. So I didn't know it would, I guess it makes sense, right? It, it's absorbed into the skin. It is absorbed into the skin. I mean, and actually anything that comes in contact with our skin can be absorbed. It gets, yes, of course. <laughs> I've, uh, after learning about that, I've, you know, started to be more mindful about when I wear gloves and things like that. Um, Cause it's true. I mean, I look at now when people are like contractors and working with chemicals and paints, it's like, that's a very, very hazardous thing um, to expose yourself to every day. Um, so, but with Chaga, the story of the skin cream is a story in and of itself. Um, I never really knew much about skin cream. I had never even used a skin cream. But when I was in college, I met a woman named Sandy Main, who was an advisor of mine who had been making skincare products since 1979. And she was very successful. She built a company and sold it. And she had just started her, her dream company, which is Adirondack Fragrance and Flavor Farm. And uh, I... I give them a shout out because they make our Chaga skin cream. Um, she reached out to me about this and it was her idea. And I was like, absolutely. I, I think that would be a great thing. And she came out with this product and I wouldn't have been able to stop selling it if I tried because people love this skin cream. There's other things in it besides Chaga that are great. You know, um, there's beeswax, there's aloe, there's olive oil. Um, but really this, this is just a product that I find alleviates any sort of irritated skin. I use it all the time on like even mosquito bites. Um, I, if one time my brother had a rash, he had an allergic reaction to some sort of a deodorant. And I was like, he had never used a skin cream in his life. And I was like, John, I'm telling you, use this, try the Chaga skin cream. And it, immediately he put it on his armpits and uh, he was like mind blown that it actually took away the pain. And, the, and so people with eczema, people that have psoriasis, people that have like irritated inflammation issues with their skin, I, I would give it a try. Um, it's not only the chaga working there, it's some other things too. And I'm not the most knowledgeable person about skin cream, but I know that this is a great product and I use it literally every day. So is it the dual extract tincture that is part of the ingredients then for the chaga? No, that is a water soluble extract. So that oh. is, yeah, um, in fact, we have a, a product called Chaga Now, which is just like a pure concentrated hot water extract or in other words a chaga tea that we've evaporated the water away from and turned into powder okay we actually give adirondack fragrance farm you know a defined amount of that 
per bottle and and they just add it in because it is water soluble so and and that's a that's a very cool product that we figured out how to make without uh a freeze dryer typically people would freeze dry something like this to make a, an extract powder which mm. is part of what all those other chinese suppliers are doing um i think that there's a, a destruction of some of the value there through the sublimation process of of converting um a hot water extract into a dry soluble powder is, is that because it's done at such high temperatures when they do it? It's uh, done at such extreme temperatures. So actually, it's some of them are quite low temperatures, like negative two hundred degrees Fahrenheit for sublimation. But some some of the value will just e sublime away and and evaporate. Um, and there's more that I have to learn there. All I know is it it creates a different product. Like the, it doesn't dissolve as easily if you freeze dry it. Um, whereas we're just using dry air um, in a, in an extremely low low moisture environment. Um, we use humidification technology and, and dry moving air to evaporate it. Um, and uh, I've kind of developed a unique process for that, that I'm trying to keep proprietary, uh, yeah. but um, it's it works, it's efficient, and it produces a better product, in my opinion. That's awesome. That's great. Let's talk a bit about artist conch, because most people have never heard of that. And I really discovered it on your site and uh it's got some really interesting medicinal properties to it so you yeah. could talk about that for a bit so artist conch to me growing up was a mushroom that was all around me and everyone knew what it was just because it's the mushroom that you can draw on and so if you've never drawn on <laughs> uh artist conch it's i guess it's hard to explain but if you touch the underside of this shelf bracket that that's what it looks like growing off of a tree if you touch the underside it will basically immediately turn brown anywhere you you, you touch it. So if you use a sharp tip, you can actually draw on it like a pencil. And when it dries, you know, it will it will stay like that. So when it's fresh, you can touch it and anywhere you touch it is marked permanently. Um, but the rest that hasn't been touched remains like a white blank canvas. So um, Mohawk artists, people that were part of the Haudenosaunee, Six Nations people um, were you know, the original inhabitants of the land I, I live in. Um, they they use these to tell stories and express art. And even today, you know, when, when you go to certain festivals where they sell their art, this is still uh, a, a part of that culture. Um, but I grew up around these and so everyone knew about them. And I guess if you hadn't had them or hadn't grown up in a Northern forest, it would be a unique experience, but it actually has a lot of medicinal value. So it's the same genus as Rishi, um, Rishi is the most famous medicinal mushroom, probably. It's known as Ling Chi in China. Um, that's Ganoderma lucidum. Uh, in the, in here, where I where we are in the Adirondacks, we have the hemlock varnish shelf, which is we call Rishi. It looks the same as red Rishi, but that's technically Ganoderma suge. Um, Artist conch is Ganoderma aplanatum. So they all are the same genus, and they all possess ganoderic acids which are some of the the diterpenes that are healing and, and have all these great properties and have been studied in reishi uh but there's less research on artist conch because it's a native america or it's a it's native to north america you know so we don't have the cultural history and research like we do have a depth and robust amount of for these chinese variants of the mushroom um and as we are starting to find this research is coming out, I'm learning the Ganoderma suge, our red reishi, is actually like less potent and less um, less medicinal probably than the, the Chinese Ganoderma lucidum. But we do have artist conch, which is actually more medicinal and, and more potent in some of these same compounds. So, and you know, there's a whole field of science called ganotherapy, which is a, uh, that looks at the whole genus of like over 80 Ganoderma mushrooms, and this is big in India. Um, it's a it's a field of research based on using Ganoderma mushrooms uh, for health. And uh, so, artist conch is more of a reflection of new learning that I've come across, which is that red reishi that grows here isn't the same as the Chinese reishi. Um, in fact, it's probably not as good. Um, and 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 artist conch, which some people call white reishi. Um, just because we don't have that cultural history, if you look to the literature that does exist, it, it shows some pretty remarkable value 
some pretty unique benefits from uh, from artist skunk too that haven't really been talked about in in many of the other mushrooms like libido. Um, it's great for your respiratory system and enhancing the rate your body absorbs oxygen. Um, it has all of the same yanoderic acids in in reishi, but at greater potencies. And there's even studies that show it like it increases the red blood cells and white blood cells and hemoglobin counts in things like trout. You know, and it so if you picture what it is in nature and where it is growing along the banks of rivers and creeks, it's fascinating to know it has such a role in the water that you know drains it takes that down into the river systems and the, the fish literally benefit from it and we look at where there's been man-made changes to the world and we have all of our trout are dying and all, and all these things are going wrong and these are part of the reasons why and i think artist conk is just like it was a decision for me you know we can chase trendy marketing uh products like that already have a known profound value like cordyceps right I don't sell cordyceps though, because I did for a brief period of time. And I realized I don't really know the slightest thing about this mushroom. I'm supplying it from a Chinese supplier. It was the only time I ever bought a, a mushroom from China. And I had no way of knowing whether or not the product I was actually selling was what it, it needed to be, what I wanted it to be. And I, and I didn't know enough about it. And I just made the decision with Artist Conk, you know, not only am I never going to do that again, <clears throat> I think it's definitely worth you know, telling the truth about things that people might not necessarily know, but it's the best, most, you know, that's the mission. It supports our mission. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. In a world where sort of nothing's sacred anymore and everyone's chasing the buck and it's all about the bottom line. Now, isn't it true also that Ganoderma aplanatum, the artist conch, doesn't it live longer than Rishi? Uh, so where it collects even more to it, which maybe is why it's stronger. <laughs> yeah, I was absolutely. I mean, that's my opinion. And actually, I, uh, the woman who owns China Walk here in my town, when she tried my red rishi tincture, she she told me it was weak. It was light. She said, and she she explained to me that Ganoderma lucidum in China lives much longer. It lives several months, and that's when I was like, wait a minute. So I mean, the artist skunk lives for years, and so. I mean, I would say it's even not, it would be the same rebuttal of, uh, you know, the Ganoderma suge to say that Chinese Rishi Ganoderma lucidum is better, that uh, that's what they would say, you know, and they're pretty educated culturally about mushrooms. Like uh, when I sell to Chinese buyers, sometimes they'll make me take pictures of the mushrooms on logs. They, they need you to include the stem when you harvest it. And they're very specific about what they want because they know you know, these factors that play into um, the quality. And yeah, I would say that it, since it grows year after year, it literally survives through the winter. So, I mean, that tells you a thing or two about the strength of the mushroom and the compounds that are in it to support that. Wow, this is, that's a huge distinction. I just think this is so important because I I really, I, I, I think the artist conks are really important. Again. Yeah. Thank you for thank you for bringing that up. And again, with the chaga, the distinction is so incredibly huge because it's growing out a living tree. None right. of these things are are fighting against a living organism. Like, and it has to kill the tree to reproduce. So, like, it has to literally take that tree and, for everything it's worth and kill it in order to spread spores. So, the value of chaga is just powerful. Oh yeah. How, how long does it take for okay. it to toast? So actually, um, I know they can't see here, but there's annual growth rings of bark that you can kind oh, cool. of an educated guess. So I mean, 10 years, eight to 10 years. And, and to take that into the context of why I'm trying to find the rights to land that I can start using to grow chaga is because like we have to start now. You know, it's not like, you know, 10 years from now, the effects of logging and all these things are going to start taking a greater toll. The effects of harvesting are going to start taking their toll. All of these things are going to start, you know, deforestation, um, the probably the the biodiversity loss in the insects that spread these spores. All of these things are going to start making a difference. So the sooner we get started, um, it's going to take eight years from when we begin. So the investment that that's going to take, we can't we can't like just inoculate trees that might then get cut down. You know, like this is going to be a huge 
undertaking and for us to put in that time and, and those resources we need to get the rights to the trees which is a hard thing to do oh yeah and i'll tell you i was shocked to find out a number of years ago that the um the wood oh my god i just lost my english the uh wood cutting the loggers the logging industry i think is it's in the top three lobbies like yeah. pharmaceutical is a number one <laughs> that's the big cartel and yeah. i think logging is like number two you know there's agriculture as well but i just had no idea it was that prominent yeah and my mascot in the in tupper lake our tupper lake mascot is the lumberjack just to put it into perspective we're <laughs> in, we are in logging central so um yeah, I know, and it's just—it's the biggest industry in the park. It, I mean, it lobbies with the state, the Adirondack Park Agency. I mean, it's actually pretty intertwined. The state has certain credits and tax advance incentives for that. <laughs> actually, there's one where if you own between fifty and hundred acres of land, so long as you commit to harvesting the timber in thirty years, you can get an eighty percent tax abatement. <laughs> so, like, yeah, there's state-funded incentives to cut the trees. I mean. And the state also does a great job, I believe, in protecting the land. We have six million acres of protected state forest here, which is which is never cut. And I do attribute that to being part of why chaga is all over the place and these other mushrooms too. Uh, but yeah, it's a big thing. It sure is. It's it's huge. My goodness, it's daunting. And and so this is why I'm just so impressed with who you are, what you're all about, your level of integrity and dedication to this, because it's so much more than just growing a business and selling mushrooms. It's this is stewardship. Yeah. yeah. And you know, I, I look at ginseng and what happened with ginseng, and I I want to get into this because it's a new, a new new dimension to this. Um Ginseng is a federally regulated plant, right? And there's an organization called the United Plant Savers who who campaigned on this and they made it federally regulated. I mean, and just just to be clear, like I would be a felon, right? If I did what I what I do with chaga to ginseng, not because it's because it's wrong, right? But just because like there's been a lot of like kind of ridiculous laws made. Um, and and I don't understand ginseng all that much. Like maybe, maybe those laws are actually totally justified, right? I really don't know, but but I worry because I see the United Plant Savers, the literal same organization that has successfully done this, right? They are, Google what they're saying about Chaga, see what they're trying to do, because there's a narrative, right? And who, and a lot of the facts are wrong and that that works to our advantage, right? Because um, we can just kind of tell the truth and explain the greater the greater context and easily kind of become regarded as the expert. Um, like, but they're saying one in 20,000 birch trees has chaga, right? Things like that. And which is just like such a weird generalization to make because that is so dependent on where you are in the world, what type of forest it is, what species of birch tree, what, you know, uh, these all, all matter. Uh, but they're coming out with these um, alarming sort of, uh, what's the word? Um, alarmists uh, that, you know, and they're, they're calling attention to this as if it's a, an issue that chaga harvesting is causing and i fear that the intentions of some of these groups are are not necessarily what they're presented as and that well, the guarantee. i i would ask right away who funds them yeah exactly. because the superb cover for ensuring that the common folk don't have access to natural medicine so their only choice will be pharmaceuticals and so if that sounds or or these cheap lab grain alternatives, right? So you can partner up with, you can even get new partners in with it. You can get pharma, you can get United Plant Savers, you can get Paul Stamets, you can get a whole crew, right? To just prevent that anyone from actually finding out about real chaga uh, or having access to it and then destroy it forever. Like some people may not think it's as malicious as that. Maybe it's not, you know, um, but I don't know. I think it's pretty well integrated and it seems like a campaign. Um, and so, uh, uh, where I was going with that is I, I see that happening potentially with Chaga. And so if, if I don't own land or, or or if I don't have real data in order to immediately dispel some some like bad decisions that aren't really going to help Chaga, then nobody will. That's how I feel about it is like I just feel the most prepared. I feel like it's my responsibility at this point and I want nothing more than to do right for Chaga. So, yeah. Yeah. 
Well, you're at a very unique advantage because of where you're situated. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know those forests, you know that area. Yeah, and I'm right place at the right time with just an open mind enough to see it. You know, that's really, it's the forest that really does this. Like, I, I don't think that we can create chaga better than nature does itself. And I think that's the problem that some of these people embrace. They, they embrace an ideology that is just like, uh, I don't know, demonic in a sense. Like we have everything handed to us in abundance on a golden platter, but but instead they, they want us to to pay for it and they want everyone to become slaves to the almighty artificial dollar. So I yes, mean, fiat system. It actually it is. It's, yeah. it's a debt based. It's a federal debt note. It's not even real. Yeah. Uh, we're on the same page on a lot of in a lot of areas. I can see why. <laughs> drawn to you, Garrett. Well, we're at the end of the first hour. And in the second hour, I want you to talk about Amanita. because I want to learn more about that. And I've been I, waiting for that. I'd love to. <laughs> awesome, awesome. All right. So I will encourage those who want to listen to more of your incredible knowledge to come over to the mushroomsapprentice.com. You could subscribe and listen to the second hour and we're going to get right into it so people can find you at birchboys.com your blog is superb and then you have a youtube channel i do yeah i i don't post as often as i'd like to but we have an instagram we have a a youtube um we have a facebook page i also have a tiktok with sixty thousand followers i don't speak oh. to as i could <laughs> But um, we're all over. If you search Birch Boys or Birch Brothers or anything of the sort, you'll find us. Um, my name is Garrett Kopp. That's sometimes you can search that for YouTube or for TikTok. But um, really, sign up to our email list if you really want to get information directly from me and and like the best information, the most consistent. Go to birchboys.com and just sign up to our email list. Excellent. All right. Great. Thank you so much, Garrett. This is awesome.